There we are. So all we need to do then is to welcome our, our, our speaker, please, um, who's going to talk about a splendid uh, book on, on Istanbul. I should just ask you at the outset, why write this book now? Oh. So the, just to explain why we're doing this, and this like, you, you might have known that I've also written a book about Socrates. So I am uh, very cre uh, keen on the idea of Socratic dialogue and question and answer. So we were deciding whether to do it as an illustrated talk. We thought that might be a bit formal since we've got such a lovely small room and you know, we can have a chat. So we're doing this in, in this sort of Q&A style. But the, the, you know, first of all, thank you so much for inviting me here this evening. What a total delight. I will attempt to bring a little bit of Eastern Australian sun into the room, uh, into this cold uh, uh, winter tonight. Um, it's, a, it's a complete delight. It is my uh, privilege to, to be able to write about this beautiful city um, of Istanbul. And the question of why now? So I've been travelling to the city for um, over 30 years. Um, I first went when I was um, 18. Uh, I, it, it, it took uh, an archaeological guide with me, just went to look at all the sites, and of course, naturally, as any sensible person would, fell in love um, with, not with a tea boy, with Istanbul, <laughs> with, uh, with the city. Um, and so I've always carried it with me, and um, as you all know, it's a city which is racing up the political agenda. Um, when I wrote this book, which, which was 10 years, ladies and gentlemen, in the, in the research and writing, I found I kept on having to rewrite the introduction and the conclusion about more times than I would have liked as, as history was being made around me. But I just think it's a critically important city to write about because not just because of its rich historical splendour, uh, not just because of its extraordinary architecture, but I think it does something much more important than that. Um, this is a city, as you all know, which is the longest surviving polity in Europe. And, and we now know from these extraordinary digs in the city, actually, that the settlement there goes back way further than we imagined, that there's a robust little settlement on what was there before Istanbul, so before the Bosphorus was formed, um, around 8,000 years ago, so 6,100 um, BCE. So it's, so it's a place which has always supported human life. But it, critically, it's always supported diverse human life and diverse human experience. So I think it's a city that tells us what it takes to make a city, but also in slightly grander philosophical terms, helps to tell us how it is that we can all live together. Because we choose to do this, frankly, quite difficult thing of living. We all know, you know, I'm sure we've all had rows with our families at some point, or rows with our neighbours. And this notion that we're going to work somehow as a species, living together, not hundreds, not thousands, not tens of thousands, but hundreds of thousands, millions at a time, is then played out in the story of Istanbul. O obviously, it, it's not a completely smooth ride. There are rough rides, but I just felt very passionately that through looking at the story of the city, we can try to understand a little bit more about ourselves as social species. So that was why I was compelled to, to write the book. But I did start it 10 years ago. So why now is sort of why 10 years ago did I start it? So, so was it a difficult process, I wonder? It, it was, of course it was very difficult because the, more difficult than what you choose to put in was to what you choose to leave out. This, this was, you know, how do you, this extraordinary place, you know, the centre of so many civilizations. <coughs> Um, and I kind of fell in love with every moment and all the characters <coughs> I was describing. So, yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. Sorry. No problem. No problem. Um, but, but it was practically quite difficult because um, I, I, I was very lucky. I had a, a, a brilliant um, teacher in the form of Robin Lane Fox who said, never be an armchair historian. Always go where history happens. And I have always done that. Um, and it feels to me that's just a very respectful way to write history. You know, if somebody was to write a, a biography of any of us, you'd want that author to spend a bit of time in your company and, you know, following you in your path and your footsteps. So I do feel the same about history. So I always, always physically go to the place where history happened. Because Istanbul, as we know, is the crucible of so many civilizations, of so many stories of the world, I ended up not expecting to, but I ended up traveling to India, to China, to Durham, you know, sort of on the trail of, of Istanbul. So it was, a, it was a very physical journey. 
Um, and I've got two, two teenage daughters, and I, I'm, you know, I, I love them, um, and I'm quite a bad mother because I'm away the whole time <laughs> filming or you know, researching or writing. So they come with me whenever they can. Um, and if you can imagine it, there was one point where I announced that we were doing yet another three-week walking, historical walking tour of Istanbul. <laughs> And I saw their shoulders go down rather than, you know, um, perk up. So I said, OK, well, a special treat. We'll, we'll, um, we'll add a, a boat trip into this journey. And, and I did that because I wanted to go and uh, look at the, the story of the extraordinary woman Theodora. Um, I'm sure everybody in this room knows about the great Empress Theodora. Uh, I'm sorry to say that sometimes when I talk to rooms of a thousand people, only two people will put up their hands and say they've heard of her. So I sort of feel my life's mission is to <laughs> write, write her back into the public consciousness. Um, but you, she needs no introduction to you. I mean, really a remarkable person. Whether everything that is said about her is true is, of course, debatable. But what's interesting now is when we're jigsaw in puzzling to, uh, together the evidence, I think it's more likely that she had a very, shall we say, troubled childhood. Um, it, I, I'm sure you do, or do all know who she is, but just in case you don't, so she's this um, uh, woman who started out right at the bottom of the pile in 6th century um, AD Constantinople. She was an erotic dancer who entertained in between the chariot races, we're told, um, in the Hippodrome in Istanbul. Clearly very clever, uh, we're told, becomes an imperial spy without putting too fine a point in it, I think, sleeps her way up through the ranks of officials, ends up in the court, attracts the attention of the to-be Emperor Justinian, who changes the law so he can marry an actress, they marry, she then becomes the empress in charge of a million square miles. So whatever the truth of the details of the story, the arc of her story seems to be quite remarkable. And as you'll probably know, she was a great fan of Baal's Theodora, only having gone from uh, the gutter, basically, to the kind of pinnacle of power, when she went to have a bath, she wanted everybody to know that she was having a bath. So we're told that she progressed with up to 4,000 courtiers um, to have her bath. And she went to, to Bursa, to the, to the uh, what was then Prusa, to the uh, beautiful Spartan, um, uh, as again, I'm sure you all know, on the Asian shores. Um, so she travelled, so I thought I'd follow in her footsteps to go to the to Theodora's Baths, which, have you all been to Bursa? Yes. 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 Have you been to the Baths? Yes. Yes, so you all know what I'm talking about. And it's an extraordinary thing that possibly the, the very bars that Theodora bathed in are there. Um, so I went with my teenage daughters, stupidly forgetting that, of course, now the, the bath that Theodora might have bathed in is a male-only bath. <laughs> and quite computed that. Got that far. I'm not going to be turned back. So did a sort of dad's army manoeuvre where I kind of hid behind a screen and, you know, advanced towards the world. Again, then, of course, realised they were all naked and so I, so I looked like this horrific middle-aged peeping Thomasina. Um, so was, but everybody was covered in embarrassment. And I, anyway, so, we, so but I did, I did glimpse Theodora's bars um, and travelled back uh, to Istanbul and on the ferry on the way back, the peaceful city that I'd left three days before had burst into flame. And these were the Taxon Square, the, the Getty Park protests of 2013. So suddenly on those little television screens that you'll know very well, on the ferry boats there were upturned cars and fire. It was before um, tear gas and the, and the uh, fire hoses had been sent in. And we were staying very close to there. So again I said to these daughters of mine, now, this is history in the making. So, I'm afraid, girls, we've got to go and, you know, witnesses, and we've got to go and get to our hotel room. It looked like it had died down, but as we arrived, that was when the, the tear gas was released. And um, my, my eldest daughter has very bad asthma, and asthma and tear gas doesn't mix, ladies and gentlemen. Um, so there was a sort of slightly panicky moment when I thought, I actually have killed them in the cause of um, <laughs> historical research rushed away, still had time to stop and take the photos of some extraordinary historical graffiti on the shop windows there, which said, uh, Byzantium, Constantinople, Istanbul, Bizim is ours. You know, amazing for me as a historian to see that that sort of passion for a historical thread was expressed at that, at that moment. So anyway, so it was tricky practically <laughs> to do it because I was, was researching and writing at a very volatile time. Um, but, you know, worth every moment. And, and again, even that experience just reminds me of two things. What a protein and poetic city it is. You know, it's a city that changes the whole time. Interestingly, this notion of a city is a city of pro Istanbul is a city of protest 
um, is something which is written, it's a, it's a thread that doesn't snap through the story of the city. You know, Nicatis Coniates famously says in the 12th century, you know, this population of the marketplace, indifference to their rulers, it is as though it were inborn in them. And, and you do get the sense that it's a city. I wonder whether it's to do with the physical layout of the city, so you have those sort of classical central squares and then medieval streets so people can join to protest and then melt away, whether that helps to, to encourage this sort of sense of, of citizenry, or is it because of the extraordinary topography of that city that it is a character in and of itself? And it's almost as if the city is such a character, the cities, its citizens have to be the city's voice rather than just the rulers. So, so it was, you know, it made me think of many things. It also made me think of that. We all know that that protest was sparked for many reasons. One of the triggers was the cutting down of trees. And, and again, there's a kind of fascinating continuity in the story of Istanbul. It's always been a city that's loved its natural spaces and places. So in the Byzantine era, because it's a walled city, so it had to grow its own food, you know, the processional way would have looked like a a giant allotment. I'm sure, you know, the fruit and vegetables grown either side of the Metze, then it becomes an Ottoman city and those green spaces become a, a cosmic garden for Allah. And we're, we're even told in the, uh, during the First World War that um, Ottoman officers outside their, their tents would plant little um, sort of window boxes because they, it was very important for them to bring, bring a bit of the living city um, with them. So, so again, just very interesting for me the, kind of the way the character of the city kind of follows through its history. So yes, so it was a, a, a rich process, occasionally a perilous process, the writing of the book. And, and uh, how far back does the city go? Does it go back as far as Neolithic times? Yeah, well, indeed, it does. So, <laughs> a, a, as you all probably know, I'm, I'm also a Hellenophile. I, I write a lot about um, the Greek world. And I have to say, the Greeks, I love them. Um, since they claim they invented history, they are very good at writing themselves into it. Um, <laughs> so of course, they tell us that they founded the great city of, of um, uh, Byzantium, which of course we now know from archeology span is far from true, that there's a thriving local community there, a thriving Thracian trading community. And you, you'll know there's very interesting work now being done on whether the Greeks come in peace or in anger, and, and it looks as though it's possibly they're just developing a very good relationship with that local community, and there's lots of Thracian words that are ending up in the Byzantine inscriptions, for instance. But the brilliance of uh, the, the tunnels being dug, and I know, again, people are mixed about the developments in the city at the moment, but for me as a historian and archaeologist, when the future of a place is thrown up, it means that the past is also thrown up with it. So incredible finds. I don't need to tell you about them in the, from, from the, uh, the, the digs of the metro and the tunnels, but just remarkable things. So, so far we have 2,000 footprints from the Neolithic period. Um, and they're illustrated in the book. If I had slides, I'll show you. They're beautiful little things in the kind of pre-Bosphoran mud. Um, when I show that slide, rather unkindly, people say I'm showing them an image of an avocado holder. <laughs> no, but I'm not. Something far more exciting, a Neolithic footprint. Um, but, but exactly as you say, this, this plucky little community, you've, you know, the remains of their lives are there. So the oldest, so far, the oldest wooden canoe paddle, the oldest wooden coffin with this 30-year-old woman curled over in a kind of fetal position evidence of 9,000 species of flora, so this sort of rich, abundant, beautiful places, pistachio forests, and you wake in the morning and plucking your fresh pistachio nuts for, you know, for breakfast, Re really amazing. But then, again, this is, um, some people contest it, I'd be very interested to hear what you think in the room, but very interesting work from the University of Liverpool suggesting that there was this massive geoseismic, geophysical event around 5,100 BCE, and with the rise of seawater, so the seawater looks as though it rises 238 feet over about 30, uh, 300 days. So that's, I mean, think of the speed of that. And 10 cubic miles of water come pouring over the land lip and flood 600 miles of land, and that's the creation of the Bosphorus. So it both destroyed that early world of, of proto-Istanbul, but also made it a world class city because suddenly it is a place that is the connector 
not just famously of East and West, but also North and South through the Black Sea. Um, and just to share with you, this, this was again research that was coming out when I was writing the book that I didn't know. You will all have been on the Bosphorus and you all know how perilous the, the currents are there. Do you know why? Have you, have you heard about this submerged river under the... So, um, yeah, so Bronte has this amazing thing that with the, with the creation of the Bosphorus and of course the drag of sediment underneath as that was formed, um, we now realise that there's a submarine channel, so in effect a submerged river mm. underneath the Bosphorus itself. And if that submerged river were on land, it would be the sixth biggest river in the world. So you've got this incredible <coughs> push and pull of water along that 20 mm. kilometres mm. or so, which is why it's so perilous to, mm. to navigate. So, and I kind of love that stretch of water because obviously it makes the city, we all know people have written so beautifully about this being a city garlanded by water. But it's sort of incarnated again because it's a city both of promise and of, and of peril, um, I think. So yes, so it, it does start uh, way back and more and more of this evidence is, is now, it's still waiting to be, to be analysed. There's plenty of news to mm. come. So it doesn't look as if the Greeks founded it then? No, the Greeks, 100% the Greeks, 100%. Now, as I said, you know, dear old Greeks, but no, somebody definitely, definitely got there first. And you'll have seen, again, just last year, there was a lovely um, tomb, a sort of central uh, Asian-shaped tomb that was found in the west of the city. Um, late, so that's a, around about 2000 BCE. So again, that either shows us that men and women from the Central Asia or influence from Central Asia is, is making its way across. I know it definitely was not virgin territory when the, when the Greeks got there. Uh, when did the Romans arrive? So the Romans, so this is, so it's then founded as Byzantion, of course, the Romans, um, uh, even though I'm making an eight-part series on Rome, which you might have seen on telly at the moment, I'm a critical friend of the Romans, I'd say. Uh, yeah. So, you know, much to admire, much, much to um, give anxiety in, in the Roman psyche, I think. And... The Romans, as we know, are very good at spotting an opportunity. So they see, of course, this is now becoming part of the, the Grand Imperial Project, um, a city which has great opportunity as an economic, as, as generating money, basically, because you can tax people as they go up and down the Bosphorus. Um, the incredible wealth of fish in those waterways in the Golden Horn means that that's also a huge, there was a huge revenue from fishing um, in, Roman period, in the Roman times. Um, but I just think it's so interesting that Septimius Severus chooses in around 200 AD to build that incredible million, the, the great mile marker, which is just left rather raggedly now at the edge of the Hippodrome. Um, it's slightly heavy. When we all last in Istanbul, so last couple of months or... No. Last month. Last month, yeah. So, you know, so the, so the million's had a little bit of a tidy up and it's, you know, got a lot of new walkway around it now and some of the cats that give birth to their kittens at the base have been encouraged out. But but I, it's an, a remarkable monument. If you, you know, if you haven't, you can't remember it, it's gosh, 20, 20 feet high, I suppose, something like that, but just sort of very denuded, etiolated bit of stone. But this is one of the most important monuments from the ancient world, because this was, for the Romans, ground zero. This All distances in the Roman world were measured from that point in Roman Byzantium, and that just shows you how centrally important it had become in the psyche, and how centrally important, particularly Eastern-looking emperors like Septimius Severus wanted to make the city. So, it's a it's a critically important place, strategically, culturally, economically for for the Romans, and, and the Milion is is our reminder of that. But what kind of city was it? I mean, was there any alcohol in the city? <laughs> <laughs> It was indeed, it was indeed quite a boozy city, I think. Um, uh, we've sort of known this from the historical, from the literary sources. So Menander, the, the Greek playwright, famously writes that uh, if you go to Byzantium, it makes every merchant a drunkard and you always wake up with a head for four. Um, but then it says, and darn strong wine, and good wine it was too. Um, there's a very beautiful uh, native poet, poetess called Moero, who's, who's, we, we don't talk about enough again, who writes rather more romantically about Dionysus and Aphrodite entwining one another and the, and the gift of wine in the city. 
And again, these amazing digs um, underneath the tunnels have exposed ships. You'll all have seen the, the images, I'm sure, packed with am amphorae of wine, which are obviously being traded, but one definitely gets the sense that there was a bit of a few boxes off the back of a lorry, as it were, in Byzantium, and a few of those amphorae ended up in the city. So I always think, I sort of try to imagine the character of these places, and I imagine it in antiquity being a little bit like Brighton in England, you know, a bit of a sort of pleasure dome, and sort of what happened in Byzantium stayed in Byzantium slightly, you know, this sort of travelling uh, community of, of sailors. So, so a place that really celebrated the, the good things of life, but, but as we said, it's amazing that the new archaeology is now backing up the, the historical evidence that we've been left with. Yes, yes. But, but, but surely it was a Christian city. I mean, yeah, <laughs> it, uh, indeed, it, indeed. So it becomes... Constantinople, mm -hmm. the great Christian city. So, a city that's boozy, <laughs> but also, and I don't know if you agree, it's a city that geographically is blessed. So through its history, it's sort of persuaded itself and managed to find ways in the religious narrative, whatever that religion is, whether it's the pagan Greco-Roman world, or the Christian world, or the Islamic world, that it is significant, it is a significant religious city as well, because it has this beautiful spirit to it, I think. Um, and, and I think it's really interesting, that early Christian city, because I think we can be a bit hard on Constantine the Great, and you know, talk about how cynical his conversion to Christianity was, and he was just doing it to kind of attract, you know, popularity. His, his soldiers and the, you know, the increasing numbers of Christians. I, I think I get the sort of sense it was more heartfelt um, than that. And certainly what he bequeaths to the city is this incredible um, uh, tradition of social justice and of caring for the poor, the sick and the needy. So from his reign onwards, huge numbers of hospitals, maternity wards, leprosy wards, you know, that those become part and part of the of the character of the city. Um, you know, the indigenous poor uh, are, are workshops attacked so that the poor can be given a Christian burial. And of course, that's to do with a, a, a manifestation of the Christian faith. But that's a, that's a, gives you pride as an individual to know that you're not going to be in a pauper's grave, that you're going to be buried, buried well. So there's this sort of interesting character to the city and, I, and again I'd love to hear from you why you think that is. Is it because of these notions of social justice that come in through the Christian faith early? Is it because it's a walled city so there's almost this sense that because you're going to be besieged you have to find ways to love those within the city, you have to have a sense of community? Is it because it's so geoseismically exciting as a, as a region? Again, it's almost as if humans are kind of matchsticks when it comes to the anger of the gods and the earth. So again, you have to find a way to, to help one another. I, I mean, I'd genuinely love to know what you think, but there's certainly, very early on, it gets a reputation as being a city of social justice and a city of sanctuary, critically. So this is a city where if you come to the gates, you don't have to be Christian. This is irrespective of religion. You come into the gates and ask for sanctuary, there is a chance that you will be given it. Um, and again, how remarkable that that's a characteristic that carries on right way through to the modern world. As we know, <coughs> there are more refugees in 21st century Istanbul than there are in any other capital city um, in the world. So, and again, sort of little moments of its history that are, that are neglected. You know, you, you all know about the Muslim population who travel there after the uh, fall of Al-Andalus. Um, but people don't, I think, know or talk enough about the, in the First World War, the Muslim orphans who were taken in and housed, and again in the book, the beautiful, poignant photographs of these little Muslim children, orphans, who'd been housed in the mosques of the city with their kind of sheets and blankets hanging up to dry behind them. Um, and again, during the Second World War, when uh, Jewish families were given the passports of Mus Muslim students and taken by train from France, from Paris in particular, to Constantinople and, and given the sanctuary. And I think that does something to the character of a city. You know, it allows it to embrace the unknown, the other, to kind of, it, it gives you a sense that you can't take things for granted. And, I, and, and I, I, wasn't, I wasn't looking for that when I was researching the history of the city. It just came to me through the original research. So I think it's a great danger, you know, of a historian of finding what you're looking for. But it was a surprise to me that, and, and, a, and a, you know, a very delightful surprise.
That's fascinating. And, and the international uh, background to the city, was it really a world city, uh, even, even that far back? And I would argue it was, yes. I mean, and it's certainly a city that um, is not, uh, it's not a city without ego, I would say, Istanbul. So the, the names it allows itself to be called, the, the greatest city on earth, the world's desire, the queen of cities. Um, but, but, it, but it is, of course, a hub of, as I said, not just north and south, but east and west and f you know, far east and far west. And we know this from, um, again, I travelled to China, to look at these new stele that were discovered a couple, so stone ins inscriptions that were discovered a couple of years ago, talking about the visits of monks from Constantinople, and this isn't the sort of famous silk smuggling story that's been made up. So we, we know that there were um, Christian monks who came there from the city. This was only uh, 18 months ago, actually, just 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 before I delivered the first draft of the book that these were discovered. So that's in China, in Luoyang, in China, in Cornwall, you know. Right down in the south of England, in Salt, Sharp, Cornwall, if you go to Tintagel Castle uh, and look at that headland, you know, so you, you can't get more remote. And in 1983, there was a scrub fire which cleared much of the, of the headland of Tintagel, and workshops and houses and storerooms were uncovered from that scrub fire. And only 10% of that area has been um, archaeologically investigated so far. And in that 10% of Tintagel's headland, there are more Byzantine pottery fragments than there are anywhere else in Western Europe. You know, and if you just do the maths on that, that is a huge amount of probably wine, probably oil, spices, well, being transported all the way from Constantinople to Cornwall. And of course you ask yourself why. The obvious answer is tin because Cornwall has tin, and I think tin was attractive. But the truth is, you can get tin two hours horse ride east of Constantinople. You don't need to do a 6,000 mile round boat trip. And I think that was happening because again, this was a city that wanted to remind the wider world that it was a part of that wider world. And we know that because Justinian and Theodora, that wonderful power couple, um, rather brilliantly, patronisingly, at one point, uh, decide that they're going to hand out subsidies to what they call the barbarians of Britannia. Um, <laughs> so we get these kind of handouts from Constantinople, which I, you know, I love, I remind people, that's a lot. Um, but, but, but that's you know, partly because they just want to keep, keep this sort of stitched network of diplomacy and loyalty and connection together. So there is absolutely no doubt in my mind that it was a truly, it was a world city before people had started to think of that phrase. Yes. Was there anything in Sutton Hoo? Yes, yes, yes. You're right. So um, Sutton Hoo, you all know the beautiful ship burial of the Anglo-Saxon nameless, is it Red Bull? We don't know, probably Red Bull uh, King, um, where beautiful silverware from Constantinople and ivory, little ivory clerks were found. So we know that there's Byzantine material in the burials at Sutton Hoo. What has only just been uncovered is actually metal detectorists six years ago uh, discovered the living city of the city of the dead of Sutton Hoo and it's about six miles away and in this living city there are huge numbers of Byzantine coins and what's really interesting is that they're scattered across the site so that tells us that this wasn't just an exotic hoard that these are First of all, it's currency, so Byzantine coinage is being used as currency in that 6th century and 7th century world. But also that probably, just that it's so random where they've ended up, those are probably travellers from Constantinople, merchants, aristocrats, like the representatives of court who've, who've come and again, either just handed out the money or have paid for it or, or have, have dropped it. Because it's, it's, it's definitely not hoard material. So again, that just reminds us that's brand new evidence. They were very excited when they, when they found the coins lovely lovely stuff um, and so that again just tells us how connected we were to Constantinople. Indeed. And did it go as far as Russia? Yes yes well of course so we have the, the you know the great connection of the, the Rus, the Vikings to the city you know the Vikings have a love-hate relationship with Constantinople they attack it many times 
you sort of get the sense they almost don't want it because <laughs> they, they're, they're fought back by Greek fire but you sort of, I sort of wonder if psychologically they think well what would we do with it once we had they're not really sort of big city they're small city people not big city people the Vikings um, but they loved much about Constantinople they loved uh, they convert to Christianity they love the silk Again, something we don't think of with Vikings often enough. They had a sort of silk fetish, so they were often wearing <laughs> lovely silk scarves from Byzantium, <laughs> silk uh, sails. And again, there are these brilliant documents where the the traders in Constantinople, Constantinople say, you know, it's pathetic because they the Vikings come and they think they're getting the richest goods, and we're just basically handling with the kind of factory shop rubbish. But they seem they seem happy with it. And there's again a, a, a wonderful uh, little ruling from the 10th century which says, I, I don't know if you remember, they don't, it doesn't, you don't really see them anymore, but do you remember on news agents, there used to be little signs saying two or three school children can only come in at once and, and only if they behave. It used to be almost all, all news agent stores. Anyway, the, and the, but the Byzantines had their sort of equivalent with the Vikings. Um, so they said that only 50 Vikings could come at a time if they came through a particular gate and if they didn't rape or pillage, then they'd be given free bed and breakfast. <laughs> <laughs> Fantastic. Medieval equivalent. You know. so, um, so the Vikings are very involved, and again, you all know the Varangian Guard, the, the Imperial Guard of the, of the emperors of the city, is made up of Vikings and of Anglo-Saxon noblemen who leave England, not wanting to live under the Norman boot. And we've got beautiful poems then talking about this sort of adventure of travelling east. And, and only recently we realised that they then end up being settled out in sort of these expat colonies on the Black Sea and the Sea of Azov. So uh, we have these little settlements called Suasco, like Saxon and Sussex. And uh, there's even a Londinia, a little settlement of Londinia um, out on those eastern seas. So, so again, we were travelling we were travelling east as well as them travelling west. And then, of course, this, this um, era came to an end and it eventually became a, a, a Muslim city. Yes. How did that happen? Well, the famous... <laughs> <laughs> very, very good from 1453, we all know from But I think, you know, what's, what it seems to me, and again, I'd be, I'd be very interested to hear what you think about this, interesting in the cities that that's so often described in the textbooks as this sort of clash of civilizations and as if it comes out of the blue somehow and as we all know the ottomans have already taken over huge amounts of that land around they've been negotiating in fine detail with the rulers of the city beforehand there are marriage alliances between them and there's this beautiful um document that's in the british library which is now online which is was written just a couple of days after the fall of constantinople which is granting uh, freedom of worship and trade to, to uh, some of the Italian community in the city and it's an absolute fair copy there are just two or three perhaps corrections to it and that that's two days after the fall of Constantinople so that tells you that these were details that had been worked out in, in a, you know really acutely in advance so it wasn't this sort of it was terrible many people died but it wasn't this blood and thunder, you know, as I said, sort of lightning bolt out of the blue that, that kind of romantically historians of what have wanted it um, to be. So there was a lot more connection, a lot more continuity, I think, in that city. And again, we now know from the, the uh, artists who are welcomed in, obviously Sinan, either a Greek or an Arme Armenian architect who beautifies uh, the city. Um, even Leonardo da Vinci, one of the sultans, establishes a bridge building competition when he gets to the city. If he'd seen our forlorn bridge building competition here, he might have had second thoughts, but um, <laughs> this is a bridge over the Golden Horn, which actually doesn't get built, interestingly. Um, and one of the men who applies to build it is Leonardo da Vinci, no less. Um, and we have, in the book again, you, there's a picture of, we've got his notebook in Paris with his sketch for the bridge over the Golden Horn. And he writes, Again, he's not short on ego, I think, old Leonardo. And he writes um, with this kind of fantastic letter to the Sultan that's being translated, which is in the archive still in Istanbul. And he says, you know, I hear that you want to build a bridge. I am the man to do it. I am the man who knows how to do this. No other man can do it. I know how to do it. And then he describes what he's going to do. And then rather kind of fantastically, it's a letter that, as far as we know, isn't even answered. It's just, you know, the classic, well, 
join the queue, let's put that in the pile of all these other wannabes who are fancy working in this great city. So, so it does change, but I said I think there's more continuity than, than perhaps we wanted to imagine in the past. But does it become the centre of the Islamic world? It gets the caliphate, but would you really call that the centre? Well, it's a centre, mm. isn't it? And I think we again, if, you know, most people forget that it's the caliphate from you know 1517. It's the Ottoman caliphate exists, and its its capital is Istanbul. Um, it's definitely emotionally a centre, and it's obviously still critically important. Islamic Centre today, and again, you know, it's become much more secular, but I think we forget that, some people forget it. Um, so it's not the centre of the Islamic world, but it's, it's, it is definitely a centre, but a centre that still keeps its extraordinarily cosmopolitan character throughout that, throughout that epoch of its history. And the, the place of, of women in this time has it changed at all? Yeah, well, I, well, again, I love it. I always sort of worry when I find amazing examples of women in history. Where again, am I looking for them, and they're just sort of popping out at me from the archive? But I think not with this city. It's a city that, right from its from antiquity, and I know this doesn't mean anything, but there is a connection with the kind of presence of the female that. Goddesses are very important to the early city, the great Kibale, the great Magna Mata, the mother goddess of nature, um, Hecate, the kind of sorceress witch goddess is very important to the city. As I've said, those Theodora and those other Byzantine empresses have real, you know, clout, and a number of them, and we think that a lot more women in Byzantium were literate than they were in other uh, equivalent European cities, so women were allowed to read and write much more regularly. And that carries on into the um, Ottoman period when you have these women in the harem who, some people had a terrible time in the harem, you know, we shouldn't look at this in any way with rose-coloured spectacles. It was a, a seedbed for um, diseases, tuberculosis was rife in the harem. Um, if you ended up a, a kind of lowly woman there, you were the slaves of slaves of slaves, you know, I think it was very grim. But if you were clever, and if you had status, you, you could definitely influence things. And um, you know, we kind of famously hear that the, the English visitors to the Istanbul court are particularly upset by how potent the women of Istanbul seem to be. They call them, there's a brilliant Englishman who calls one of them a mediatrix. I love that thing, you know, the idea that you have to go through these annoying women in order to kind of get the ear of the Sultan. Um, and I just, so, well, I, I might just um, uh, give you a tiny little snippet from Safiye, if I can find her. So, of course, Safiye, uh, an inhabitant of the harem who joins, uh, she comes in the uh, 16th century, stays there through to the beginning of the 17th century, and um, starts out as life in an Albanian <laughs> village as a 13-year-old girl taken to, to the court, Safiye means pleasing one, so she was probably very beautiful, also very smart, ends up uh, producing an heir who is then the sultan, so she then becomes the valide, the, the mother of the sultan, which as you all know, it's harder to have more power as a woman in the world at that point than to be the mother of the sultan, and Safiye is such. And what's brilliant is that two things, again, the English diplomats report very agitatedly that she seems to be rushing out and defending the whores of the city. So there's one moment where her son's out of town and the eunuch vizier goes and starts sort of harassing the, the whores of Istanbul. And Safiye, I mean, God, no, fair play to her. So this is, this is, this is um, a, a report by John Sardison, who was the secretary of the English embassy. He says that Safiye, while walking in the Seraglio, espied a number of boats upon the river hurrying together. She, Safiye, then heard that it was the vizier bustling out to do justice upon certain chabbies, that is, whores. She, Safiye, taking displeasure, sent word and advised the eunuch vizier Bassa that her son, the sultan, being absent on campaign, had left him to govern the city and not to devour its women. You know, like, you know great, what a, what, a, what a great character. But then she carries on to have this extraordinary um, correspondence with, with Elizabeth I, with our own Elizabeth I, and um, and much of this still survives. They give one another gifts, they indulge in sort of competitive gift giving. Uh, you know, so it's the tiaras and the golden carriages, you know, <laughs> yes, it got a bit more and more um, exotic. 
And then they start to write each other, and I sort of love the tone of the letters, because it's sort of saying, and the men are slightly mucking things up, aren't they? Let's just <laughs> sort out these international politics between us. So they negotiate a couple of trade deals and sort out the fact that um, English soldier, uh, sailors have been taken um, uh, hostage by pirates, and they sort out the ransom. So, so, and the, you know, it's a very warm. Um, the tone of the letters are very warm. So, this is Sapphire writing to Elizabeth I in 1593. I can repeatedly mention Her Highness's gentility and praise at the foot dust of His Majesty, the Sovereign who has Alexander's place. I shall endeavour for your aims. Your letter has arrived and reached us, God willing. Action will be taken according to what you said. So she's basically saying, you know, I'll sort it out. Don't worry, don't worry, let's not bother the Sultan with this. Um, may we always be firm in friendship, God willing. May our friendship never die. Um, and then there's this rather brilliant moment where, dare I say, at the risk of sounding sexist, that because they're both women, um, at the end of the letter, uh, they start to exchange makeup tips. <laughs> uh, and so Safie writes, um, on account of your majesty's being a woman, I hear there are to be found in your kingdom rare distilled waters of every kind for the face and odiferous oils for the hands. Oh, your majesty would fade me by sending some of them to me for my hand. And then she's obviously realised that she's in the harem, so it's really likely that these beautiful hand lotions are going to get taken by some of the other inhabitants of the harem. By my hand only to this, the most serene queen, Safie, because, being articles for ladies, she does not wish them to pass through other hands. So it, it, it's, just a, it's just a tiny little thing, but it's sort of... Helps to I just remind me of the kind of the brilliance and the and the brio of the city of a city where it was possible to have an impact for men and women of all degrees and from all backgrounds. So it helps us see the city in, in a new light. Yes. yes. And what about spies talking about giving the influence? Yes. Is that for sure you think spies? Yes. Well, it was said to be in the 20th century the spy capital of the world. Um, <laughs> Because of so many nations and cultures being there, because there was this tradition, because of the dragomans of these, you know, men who could speak very, you know, were fluent in two, three, sometimes four languages. So a very good place. There was, as somebody said, if you fall on death comes to you quickly in Istanbul. If you fall on the tongues of of strangers. So it was a a place where truth of all kinds um, was transferred. Mm, yes. well. Well, I think that's been a wonderful interview. Is there something we should learn from this this, this tapestry of the city for over the centuries? The message or something? Um, I, I think there is. I think that it's a city. There's a very beautiful, very early um, proto-Indo-European word. So we're going right back to prehistory. Uh, so it's probably something from at least 8,000 years ago. And it's... Um, uh, the word is gosti, G-H-O-S-T-I, and that comes down, uh, comes through the Anglo-Saxon roots and gives us the words guest and host. So this idea that guest and host were originally one and the same thing. And it's almost an unwritten etiquette that I think allows civilization to happen. And, and what gosti means is that when those very early communities in Asia and beyond, when they saw figures on the horizon, rather than automatically assuming that they were enemies, and rather than automatically picking up your weapons, you would take the risk of welcoming them across your threshold, because they might come and steal your livestock and steal your wood, but more likely they were coming to trade goods and ideas and to bring fresh blood to your community. And it's a kind of remarkable thing, this sort of calculated risk that humans take, that maybe it's worthwhile opening our doors to strangers. And it feels to me that, in many ways, Istanbul is the incarnation of that very early, beautiful idea of gospi, which then, if any of you are linguists, sort of comes down actually through the Greek world as xenia, as this guest host friendship, which, which turns up in classical texts as well. Because it feels to me that it's a city that accepts that in order to not just survive but thrive, you have to have collaboration both within and beyond your borders, and, and it's a city that I think to slightly misquote Wordsworth, reminds us that although humanity has many faces, we all share one human heart. So, you know, this beautiful city that's been described as Allah's city, as the second Jerusalem, the second Rome, 
um, a, a virgin who's enjoyed many husbands. Uh, as we know, famously Napoleon said, if the world were one country, then Istanbul would be its capital. It's this remarkable place. I, why I love it is because I think it is constitutionally cosmopolitan. So I think it's a city that reminds us what it is to be effective citizens of the world. Yes, absolutely, absolutely. So, so if anybody's got any questions, but if you're embarrassed, though, you don't have to ask questions. Yes, lady. I'd love to know about the subterranean river under the Bosphorus. Yes. I mean, does it go in line with the Bosphorus? Or, or no, it looks like it goes the other. So, it's, the channel travels the other way. So that's why so you've got this. Yes. Yeah, so up, up, up. No, no, no. So it goes. It travels up. Up the Bosphorus, but, but in the different, in a, you know, in the, the different direction, which is why you have that push and pull. Oh, it is, right. an, it's an incredible. It's the, if you go to the University of Liverpool's website, they've got um, lots of detail about it. Um, maybe able to add something to it. Oh, please, yeah. Basically, uh, if salt water um, is denser, yes. and you've got the um, large rivers that empty into the Black Sea exclusively. Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, unless there's any particular reason for mixing, you are likely to still have some sort of stratification. Yes. Mm -hmm. So you're going to get saline, non-saline, which will could give you that yes. countercurrent. Yes. Yes. I think. Well, I think that's absolutely, exactly, absolutely right. I mean, it's a remarkable, and isn't it amazing? It's only just been discovered. Mm -hmm. But I suppose it's just you know that's time and money, isn't it? You know, people didn't have the. We're big still finding out about the depths of the oceans. So. Well, we're still finding out about the leaves on the trees outside. Yeah. So. Yeah. <laughs> The, the, the exact parameters are being traced no doubt, but the, uh, the, in the First World War, E11 actually sat on the difference in current. So E11 was a British submarine going through the going through yes, the Bosphorus, yes. and then they were running out of charge, and so they simply sat on the on the difference in the density of the water really? to, to, to recover for a bit. So, so, so yes, his, the commander's name was Naismith. So he he, he, he he was able. To, I don't think he knew about that radar. I think he kind of stumbled upon it How during his because he was trying to sink the Ottoman. Um, yes. in, in, in the yes. He wrote a book about it as well. Yes. Yes. yes well, there we are. That will have to go into the next. <laughs> <laughs> so the, the river comes from the Black Sea end. The the flow Ooh, the comes flow. from the Black Sea end. Ooh. Yes. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Through to the Marmara. Yes. Yeah. So it's. I mean, it's you know, it's an incredible. Mm -hmm. It's an incredible thing. Mm -hmm. It's a very beautiful. And I've seen photos of it. And it's just. It's beautiful. It's otherworldly. Kind of beauty, this just this kind of ghost that's there, but obviously not uh, utilized if not understood, probably. Indeed, yeah, indeed, yeah, indeed. yeah. Yes. Uh, yeah, um, back to Justinian and yeah. Dora. Yeah, <clears throat> how do you get your head round one day he's slaughtering, I think he quoted 30 to 30, 50,000 yeah. greens and blues, and then almost without blinking, he's introducing laws about that we hold today that people yes. are presumed innocent and sort of prove guilty yes it's, it's a weird mix it is a weird mix and it's but it's you know they were different times <laughs> and i'm not obviously not doing this is you just in order to you know no ruler actually interestingly the Byzantine rulers tend to be less aggressive than other rulers of the time, partly because of that Christian ethos. So they say that they're trying to maintain peace rather than to aggressively take that. I mean, I think, you know, I think that gets sort of slightly forgotten sometimes in the kind of real politics of the moment. But you're right, how, how do you justify those two things? And I think, you know, there's no doubt that, that he slaughtered his way and maintained his power through slaughter. But I do think they were very, there's just an interesting about the two of them. They, they have such humble origins, both of them. And if you look at, this is why I think Procopius is probably, there's more in what he says about Theodora. It's, I think it's not just slander. Because if you think that the laws that together they pass and the ideas that they generate, this that again, notion of social justice, you know, her setting up a safe house for prostitutes and them increasing the penalties for rape, trying to outlaw uh, pandering and sex trafficking and pimping and infanticide, those are incredibly uh, out of their time uh, reforms to pass. And I, and I suspect that they both had t 
tough early lives, and Theodora in particular, as soon as, isn't it interesting that as soon as she has power, she physically, as it were, puts her money where her, her mouth is. And we have a beautiful little account of, again, she was a great welcomer of refugees, which talk about the refugees to the city. And they weren't put into some sort of concentration camp, they were brought into the imperial palace itself. And there's a, com a carpenter who's complaining because Theodora's welcomed in so many refugees to a particular room that the floor has collapsed and he's having to come in and mend it. So it's this sort of very kind of quotidian little example, but isn't that amazing that that tells us about an idea of, you know, you know physically embracing an idea of, yeah. of sanctity. And, and of course, Theodora also prevented him fleeing. Yes. I mean, there is no doubt she's a feisty woman, yeah. you know. <laughs> there are feisty women in history, you know. We, they, even if they're not allowed to express themselves, yeah, they you, were you definitely told there. told us about one last Friday, Cleopatra. Oh, yes, <laughs> yes, oh, yes, indeed, I know. Oh, gosh, gosh, yes. I'm sorry, well, it's Boudicca this Friday. So, uh, you know, it's, it's obviously... That's a tough woman, man. Yeah, I know, exactly. And that, just a completely off-topic, off there is some really interesting archaeology in that programme. So, in Colchester, I don't know if you read about the Fennec Hoard, which they discovered. So Colchester was one of the cities that Boudicca famously burnt to the ground. And um, they discovered that they're rebuilding the Fennec building. And it is an, it's an incredible, it's almost too good to be true because it's sort of perfect archaeology. So it's a family's larder, and the, the heat of her fury and her fires has flash burnt the contents of the larder. So you have perfectly preserved Mediterranean produce. So there are figs and lentils and mostly perhaps absolutely perfect. It's like it's like Herculaneum, perfectly preserved. So that's extraordinary enough. And then the family fleeing from Boudicca's fury, they've hidden their jewellery underneath the floorboards of the larder. So their gold is also there. So these and these sort of precious the little bulla, something which isn't precious but was obviously emotionally important. Beautiful gold. Um, uh, earrings and bracelets, you know, it's, it's just incredible. So that's anyway, so you can see that on telly for the first time. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. I'm so sorry that I have to rush off, ladies and gents, but I've, I've, it's just one of those yeah. times, <laughs> times of year, I think it's because it's of all these, these telly things happening as well. So. Well, we, we, we thank you very much for coming to speak with us and wish you good fortune for your masterpiece. Oh, yes. bless you. Thank you. Thank you so much for, for coming. And I also, we were trying to get books here and we couldn't work it out, but, oh, you signed, yes, yes. So if you've got one, absolutely, I'll, I'll sign it. And I'm just trying to think of a way, um, if, if anybody wants sort of signed copies of Christmas presents or anything, if you contact me via my website and just give me your address, I could send out little, um, you know, cards with a signature on. So I'm not, you know, you might well not want to give it to anybody. <laughs> <laughs> uh, if, if you did, then then that's that, that's an option. But thank you, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.